Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time the boat, battered by the waves, far, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come up on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. <clears throat> when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Sometimes we ask, where is God when we need him? Why is this happening to me? Why do I deserve this? What happens when human beings and governments face problems more powerful than they are and we are. In a way, Jesus' own world had been turned upside down. We hear about the storm on the Sea of Galilee, but there's a storm within Jesus here, and he goes to be alone. He sends his disciples to get in the boat and go away from him, to go to the other side of the lake. John the Baptist, his cousin, had just been killed. And Jesus withdraws to the wilderness to be alone. Sometimes he tried to be alone, but it doesn't happen. Because people had heard that Jesus was out in the wilderness. And I guess it's no longer a wilderness when thousands of people come out and find you. You know, being a one person and a young man at that, he could have gone faster and further than they could have. But I love that it says, but Jesus had compassion on them. He had compassion upon these crowds that are getting in his space. That even while so much turmoil is going on in him, he has compassion for them. He says he cured their sick. Because not only is the Jesus having eternal turmoil and facing grief, the people that had come were sick. And they were facing and seeking what only Jesus could do for them. They too were facing uh, forces in their lives that were bigger than them. And they came to Jesus for help and for hope. Hoping that he would call this storm in their own lives. And he did. It says he cured the sick. Now since it was a deserted place, and not only were the grocery stores closed, there weren't any. Who knows, bought toilet paper, bottled water, there wasn't any. So Jesus takes a couple loaves and a couple fish. He blesses them. He gives them to his people, his disciples. And his disciples take what is very little out to those that are hungry who had gathered in this wilderness. And over 5,000 people were fed. And afterwards, Jesus takes his disciples, sends them on their way, go across the other side of the lake. He dismisses the crowds. And he heads up the mountain to finally be alone with this storm that's going on in with him. Because he's obviously been touched, affected, by the death of his cousin, John the Baptist, he goes up the mountain to be alone to pray. 
There's a lot of aloneness in here, isn't there? In a way, Jesus' disciples are now alone themselves. They're alone on the Sea of Galilee. And if you've ever been on a small boat on a big piece of water, that's alone. There's no one near you. And if you're far enough out, there's no one, nothing no one could do for you. And certainly in Jesus' day, there were no helicopters. They sent Jesus, Jesus sent them ahead, and they leave Jesus behind. They set out across the lake on a seemingly ordinary crossing. You can see one side of the Sea of Galilee to the other, but it's a long ways. But then, as they say, the weather started getting rough. But their tiny ship was tough, if not for the... <laughs> Never mind, but you've seen it. The, yeah, the winds are coming up. And they are in trouble. They felt powerless in the midst of the storm they were facing. <coughs> Think about it. It was probably pitch black. The waves are crashing into the boat. You're up to your knees in water. And boats, as they start taking up on water, start getting less stable than they ever were before. So the water's rising, and the ship, small, well, it's a big boat, is even less stable than it was before. They're being pelted by spray and foam. And, you know, not only viruses are contagious, but fear is contagious. You know, I was in a bad situation with a friend of mine, and he said, Paul, when I saw that you were scared, <laughs> I knew I needed to be. And that's going on. As like Matthew, the tax collector, who has essentially an office job, starts seeing Peter, the fisherman, getting panicky. You know that Matthew was feeling it as well. You got a bucket and you're bailing as fast as you can. But everyone senses it's a losing battle. We're going backwards, but no one's willing to say it. You hear your friends in between grunts as they bail, row, and handle the boat. Imagine this. Imagine if you're throwing a bucket of water over the side and you think you see something. You pause for a moment and you go, I'm just like obviously seeing things. You blink the water out of your eye and you keep on bailing and then, wait, there you've seen it again. And it looks like a person. You set your bucket down, you're looking in the in the waves, and you think you see a person out on the water, and what are you thinking? Is, is this what it's like to die? How can it be someone in the storm? The others see you petrified at the rail of the boat, stop for a moment, and they begin to look, and they see the same thing. Bailey's forgotten, rowing ceases, the tiller just kind of starts swinging, and then in the midst of the calm, in the midst of the storm, there's a voice. Calm down. It's just me. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Probably the last thing they expected to hear. Our world is obviously in the midst of a storm. It's not a very subtle metaphor I've been using here, is it? In this account of Scripture, many of the people on board that boat were fishermen. They knew boats. They knew the Sea of Galilee. They knew the storms that would come up suddenly. But even though so much was familiar and they had been in stone, storms before, what they faced was beyond their ability, beyond their control, beyond anything they could handle on their own. Consider this. The place where they used to make their living is starting to look like the place where they're going to die. For us. Things are really different now than they were three weeks ago, aren't they? Three weeks you could go, go, you could buy tons of toilet paper and buckets of hand sanitizer. The stores were stocked to the gills with them. COVID-19 was a problem in China. Not here in Oviedo. Three weeks ago, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was about 27,000. Now it's below 20,000 and plummeting. Traveling through Oviedo the last couple days, it's been pretty strange. People coming here today, like Mike and Peter, have said, wow, there's no one on the roads. And 
yet if you do make it to a grocery store, there's been long lines at weird times of the day. The paper goods aisle is absolutely empty. And there's kind of a strange look in people's eyes. We know we're into something, and we don't know what's going to happen. People that are otherwise very active get out and see people and are with people are sheltering in place and hiding. And goodness knows uh, the news channels don't help bring about any peace and calm, do they? The places we thought we knew, where we live, where we were used to doing things our own way and getting what we want and doing what we needed has now been transformed in the reality of this virus. The need to protect ourselves, the need to not be part of spreading it to other people. And here, this place where we thought once thought we did a pretty good job and we knew how to handle what came along has become a place where we've got more questions then we've got answers. Like the disciples in the boat, we're in the midst of a life and death threat. But and it is totally beyond our control. There are things we can do that will help us, and very importantly, help others by not sharing exposure with others. And yet even then, there's a person from our congregation who worked at a place where someone brought their child through their office. That office is now tested positive for the virus. There's another person whose daughter had worked two days with someone who had been a little sick, who has tested positive for the virus, who came and visited them only to find out about that testing, that they had been exposed over a two-day period, and then had come and spent several days with their mother. This is not theory. This is real in our lives and in the lives of our congregation. You know, there are hundreds of cases. Uh, Seminole Health, Florida Health, has a great dashboard with updates about infections, those that have been tested, those that have been, that have been confirmed. You can see some of the people came from Egypt and Jordan recently, and other people were just in New York, but they're now testing positive. Looking at exponential curves, we're probably at the shallow end of what's going to get steeper. <coughs> It is a real thing. Some people are going to get sick, and some of those will die. Our boat is rocking. The wind is rising. And yet, in the midst of the storm, Jesus appeared. When the disciples thought they were alone out in this great storm, it was there that Jesus appeared. When they were in danger of sinking, even though they were doing everything they could, but it wasn't enough, Jesus was enough. Jesus speaks and says, Take heart. Don't be afraid. An interesting point is that when Peter gets out of the boat to walk to Jesus, the storm is not yet stilled. The storm is raging. And if you're in a boat in a storm, the last thing you want to do is be out there because if your boat sinks you're out there you've been working hard to do everything you can to be to avoid being in the water but Jesus but Peter decides to go and to be with Jesus even if it's in the midst of the very thing he had been working so hard to avoid and yet when he's out there, he begins to do something Peter himself could never do. But then he thinks about it. He goes, I could never do this. And he's right. He could 
never do that. And he begins to sing. And I love that in this failure of faith, where Peter had lost track of Jesus, even though Jesus is standing out there, he had lost track of Jesus that even though he is walking on water, he began to think it was about himself and about what only he can do. He begins to flounder. And Jesus, rather than letting him go down one, two, three times, Jesus, rather than consequences for losing his faith, for losing track of Jesus, Jesus reaches out and takes the hand of Peter who had floundered, Peter who had taken his eyes off Jesus. But Jesus is there anyways. Lifts him up. They get in the boat. And the wind ceases. The storm calms. And fear begins to subside. And they say, truly, truly, you are the Son of God. So what are we as God's people to do in the midst of a storm? And let's face it, storms are inevitable. Storms happen in life. Our lives can be rocked. We can feel like we are sinking. I think everyone here has been in a situation where You've experienced something that came upon you that you had nothing to do with creating. And yet it's overwhelming you. It's bigger than you. And oftentimes you can feel alone. But in the midst of those circumstances, our great hope is in looking for and expecting and beginning to see someone greater at work within that storm and within us and around us. In the midst of the storm, there are some things that we need to do. We need to look for Jesus. But the interesting thing is, we need to look for Jesus in unexpected places. You ever notice that Jesus shows up when people don't expect it? That Jesus does things when not expected? In the midst of the storm, Jesus appears. Not where we expected, but where we need him. Who would have expected to find the Messiah in a manger? Why would they? Who would have expected Jesus to be walking on water? And a key element here that I have discovered in my own life is we often see God's presence as we serve others rather than dwelling on our own needs. When we begin to look towards the needs of others and other types of trouble or even the same type of trouble as ourselves. Where do we find Jesus? We find Jesus ministering to people. And as we begin to be part of God's process of caring for others, we find Jesus saying, when we're tempted to think about, woe is me, and touch the life of someone else, we find Jesus, and we even find relief from our own storms. Look for Jesus in unexpected places. And another thing is, you know what? There's going to be storms even if you do exactly what Jesus calls you to do. Storms and difficulty are not a sign that you've been abandoned. Jesus' disciples were doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. When Jesus told them to do it. He said, get in your boat now, is the implication. You sail to the other side of the lake. Jesus sent them into a storm. They were going to the other side. Jesus didn't say there won't be a storm, but he gave them hope and safe passage, even in the midst of the storm. What else are we to do? We're, we should not miss surprising opportunities. Often the thing that is overpowering to us also carries amazing possibilities. The very things that we ourselves might be tempted to avoid become a means of God blessing us and blessing others. I often talk about uh, egging someone on, twisting their arm, 
to go out and serve meals to people that are homeless and hungry. And they come back and say, you know, I really didn't want to go to start with, but I am so glad I did. Peter, he was more, would have been working as hard as he could to avoid getting in the water. In the midst of the storm, because Jesus is there, can step over the rail. There's an amazing opportunity when Jesus is there in the storm with you. And remember, remember that you're in God's hands, not the clutches of the storm. That although there is a major health threat going on, you're in God's hands. God is bigger than us. Yet when we begin to panic, my reaction, human reaction is bail faster. To take it upon ourselves, failing to remember that we are the Lord's and he has not abandoned us. That as we bail, we know that even there, God is with us. If you start to sink, if you start to sink, cry out for help. Don't be silent. <clears throat> cry out for help. Left on his own and faced with his powerlessness, Peter began to sink. However, as he began to come that fault go down, he called out to Jesus. Jesus who reached out and brought him to safety. The truth is that most of us have probably on a daily basis, taking our eyes off of God, of his presence in our lives, of his love and his power. Most of us have gone a lot deeper than our eyeballs into trouble, often trouble of our own creating. I know I've gone completely under. The good news is that Jesus has come to seek and to save the lost. That even though we may feel like we're drowning, even though we are overwhelmed with the cost of our own sin, Jesus is there to reach out to us. That when we are in the storm of the life, we are to reach out to others. Reach out to others. When the sea was calm, there was plenty of room for everyone in that boat. That when Peter received good news, it was good news for everyone. We are called to be beacons of hope, messengers of good news, not just in what we say, but who we are, how we live, and how we love. We're not keepers of a secret, but people who are to spread it all over and everywhere. Not just in what we say, but in what we do that gives evidence of the faith we have. We are here. We are in Oviedo. We are in the world. We are in our families' lives. We are in the lives of people we know around the world. And how we live, how we love in the midst of this crisis is to be a beacon and a light. A guide around danger to point the way to safety and to offer hope. Let there be no doubt, we will face storms in life. We will face danger. And rather than being immune to these dangers, Christians are more likely to experience these storms than others. We're more likely to find ourselves in tough places and beyond our capabilities because God sends us beyond knee deep in the waters of the lake. He sends us to people that are in need. He sends us to people that are in crisis. The good news is that even in the midst of that storm, we're not alone. We can hope, we can have courage, that even as the winds toss, waves toss and the wind blows, we can know that the one who calls the storms can call even me and you. Amen.
I'm thankful to be part of this congregation that has so much love and generosity. 